Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm going to tell you about our center we have at Oklahoma State University. It's relatively new. It's three years old. And by academic standards, that is very short. But I think we've accomplished quite a bit. Um, I have three messages for you today. I want to communicate to you what we're doing at the Center for Health Systems Innovation to transform rural and Native American health. That's the niche we picked. Then I'm going to talk to you about health data and health data analytics and hopefully convince you that whether or not it's overload or opportunity, we believe it's opportunity. And then kind of our vision for making Oklahoma and OSU one of the centers of excellence for this exploding field of kind of predictive medicine and health analytics. And then um, at the end, we'll also talk about how we've embedded some of these programs in our medical education. Um, real quickly on the vision, our vision is to transform rural and Native American health. Our mission is to do that through the implementation of innovative care delivery and IT solutions. Why did we pick rural health? As a former venture capitalist and entrepreneur for 20 years before I took on this center, um, I realized there's a lot of innovation in the urban areas for obvious reasons. They're big markets, they're consolidated, the financial winds are big. Not many people are focused on rural health care. We decided to focus on rural health care because it's an unmet need. There aren't a lot of people innovating in rural health care, yet the needs are significant because the challenges are different. Rural patients tend to have more demands than the urban counterparts because the hypertension rates are higher, the congestive heart failure rates are higher, the tobacco use rates are higher. Basically, across many of the chronic metrics, rural patients tend to perform worse than their urban counterparts. But if you look at the delivery side, the physicians are in the delivery side are woefully understaffed. We have a significant glut or dearth, not glut, dearth of physicians in the rural markets, both at the primary care level and the subspecialist level. So significant challenges in the delivery of rural health care. So that's why we pointed at rural health care to really address an unmet need. Second is, is Oklahoma is largely a rural state. Thirdly, Oklahoma State University is a land grant university and as part of our mission is to focus on rural, rural issues. When I started this center three years ago, I said I want to make sure I build capabilities because I want every innovator out there around the country, anybody watching online, anybody here today, that if you want to innovate in healthcare, I'm putting in place the building blocks for you to be a single turnkey solution for your, for your, for your innovations. To do that, we've focused on building two sets of capabilities at the highest level. We've built our innovation capabilities, but equally important, we've built the implementation capabilities. Because innovation without implementation yields PDFs. And PDFs are interesting, and they're great to download and read, but we really want to make sure that in addition to doing the PDFs and the publications, that we're actually implementing those things. So I focused on the innovation side to deliver, focus on two areas of innovation for rural healthcare. The first is care delivery innovation, looking at how do we improve the way we're delivering healthcare in the rural marketplace. More from a business model perspective, can we be smarter about how we do things? Can we be more efficient in rural markets on how we do things? And can we address those challenges on the delivery of rural health care, which is different than urban health care? And then the second is focusing on predictive medicine. We are really blessed because we were donated a large data set by one of our alums that I'll tell you about a little bit later. So our innovation capabilities focus in care delivery in rural medicine and in predictive medicine. Now, I talk about them separately, but they're integrated because there's lots of things we're doing in predictive medicine to develop tools to improve care delivery, and a lot of things that come out of our care delivery also are informed by our predictive medicine side. On the other side, we built our implementation network because, once again, I told you I didn't want to just have an innovation center. I wanted to have the implementation capabilities in place. The first thing we did is we launched what's called the health access network with a contract with our local state Medicaid payer. So we're now currently managing 25,000 patients through our center, providing care and case management services to largely rural Medicaid patients in about 14 different clinics with about 28 different physicians. So you can already see I'm starting to develop this network to actually test these innovations because I have an intimate relationship with these physicians. Second thing we did is we launched a rural practice-based research network. There are about 200 different PVRNs throughout the country. We are now the third, I believe, rural practice-based research network that's focused only on rural health care. We've already recruited for that. We've got 19 physicians across 15 different clinics. And then the last part of my implementation network is we, as a land-grant university, have extension offices in all 77 counties. So you can see I've built this implementation network that starts in and around Tulsa through the Health Access Network, expands rurally through the RockNet, 
and expand statewide through the Cooperative Extension Network. Here's the entire organization. We have uh, 30 full-time employees working in the center. Three years ago, it was me. So 33 years later, we have 30 people. I'm really proud of this. And these are 100% dedicated people to the center. These aren't people that are 10% allocated, 25% allocated. They are 100% dedicated to the center. And we have about 10 or so graduate students that are working on projects with us. We're really excited about what we've been able to build. And this is color-coded by what their functions are. Red is care delivery, light blue is predictive medicine, purple is my health access network, green is our uh, rural practice-based research network. So let's talk a little bit about healthcare data and shift there real quick. So we've gone through a big transformation where we've transformed unstructured data, which is on the left, to digitized data on the right. I always point out to people that when you look back as recently as two, uh, two, uh, 2010, only 15% of the hospitals were running an EMR system. Now we're at about 90%. It's a brand new industry that we've just digitized health information. And I'm not going to get into the religious arguments on whether you think EMRs are good or bad or otherwise. But we can all agree that digitized health data on the right allows me to do things that data on the left doesn't allow me to do. I can do it, but I have to do chart pulls. Over here, I can extract the data. Healthcare data is growing dramatically because of that. Um, this is the number of exabytes of healthcare data. I had to look it up. Uh, exabyte is a billion gigabytes because I didn't know what an exabyte was. Um, here's our data set that was donated to us. The founder of Cerner Corporation, the CEO, is a graduate of Oklahoma State University. Uh, Cerner donated a data set with 63 million clinical six, patients from 63 million, clinical data from 63 million patients covering 16 years. It's real world, it's de-identified, it's HIPAA compliant. We have admission data, discharge data, billing data, pharmacy data, laboratory data, clinical events data on these patients over 16 years, which allows us to do things that are really exciting, like predictive modeling. The graph on the right-hand side is actually all my data. We actually uh, got all the data. We linked it based on organ systems, and you can see we actually moved it to the different parts of the, the body. You can see the cardiac data in red, the spine data through the middle, the pulmonary data in black, the neuro data at the top. It's just kind of a fun thing we did to sort of represent our data. And the lines in between show you the interconnectivity of the data. And this quote is actually what we're all trying to do in predictive medicine is whereas the individual man's an insoluble puzzle, once we find a whole bunch of people just like you, he becomes a mathematical certainty. So I'm an unsolvable puzzle for many reasons uh, individually, but if we can find 100 Williams, then we can figure out how he actually might respond to things. Let me show you a couple of examples of projects we've done in the data, and many of these were done by medical students. So this is we pulled 385,000 septic patients data, and we calculated their SIRS and their QSOFA score to see how predictive the various SIRS and QSOFA programs are to predicting uh, septic mortality from septic shock patients. It, really interesting study, and it shows you why people have moved to QSOFA over SIRS in terms of predictability. The second thing we're doing is we're actually building our own models to try to improve QSOFA. Next is an example of a study that we did looking at drug outcomes for AFib patients, uh, both on digoxin and cardiozem. And at the end of this, what you end up seeing is you definitely see a link in terms of mortality depending on whether the patients are male or female or based on gender. And this is some of the power you can do in the data. The last project I want to show you is we developed a predictive model for diabetic retinopathy. Big challenge in rural medicine is very few diabetic patients make it to the ophthalmologist to get their annual eye exam. So we said is, could we actually use their existing data and predict whether or not they got diabetic retinopathy? Turns out, I think we can. We started with about 2 million patients. We ran the analytics, and we ended up with 14 different variables that we think can predict whether or not a patient has diabetic retinopathy. Really exciting program. But when I saw all this, I said to myself, we need to think about medical education, because we're going in a different way, right? If you think about how we're actually currently educating our medical students, it's the way we've been doing it for 100 years. Yet if you think about the way healthcare is going to be delivered, mobile health, telehealth, predictive models, clinical decision algorithms, they're not getting any of that. So we decided, let's launch programs to support this. So we launched High Tech, which is the Health Information Technology Entrepreneurship Club to support medical schools entire, through their entire program. We launched an innovative program called IMED, which stands for Innovation in Medical Education, Engineering, and Entrepreneurship and Design. They start with me in the second semester of their first year, and they're with me for 18 months. And during that course, 
They get to learn design thinking, rapid prototyping, mobile health, telehealth, how to do predictive models, how to do clinical decision algorithms, et cetera. Uh, we've launched analytic programs uh, to get certificate programs in informatics and analytics, and then we support the residency programs as well. So at the end, what I hopefully at the end, what I want to do, given that we're in Silicon Valley, is I have a vision that I want to make Oklahoma and Oklahoma State University one of the Silicon Valleys, one of, because there'll be many of them, one of the Silicon Valleys for predictive medicine. So hopefully in summary, I'll give you a, a snapshot of what we're doing for rural and Native American health. My belief that healthcare data is an opportunity for us, and my belief that we need to stick innovation into medical education so that these physicians are being trained on where healthcare is actually going. And with that, I think I've got enough time. I've got a lot of video that I want to show you, which is where I think we're going in health, predictive medicine, but hopefully it won't hurt, it won't go this far. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary, may I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Corp, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could save $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh. But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. <sighs> That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's nineteen ninety nine even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Want to stop this? So anyway, a little fun little video that ho hopefully our, our world doesn't turn in when we order pizza, that we have a fully integrated system that links to our travel records, our medical records, our financial records, et cetera. But we're really excited about what we're doing because I do think this whole area of predictive medicine and clinical algorithms is really exciting. And how do you embed innovation into medical education? And so thank you very much. I appreciate the time to present today.